The personal issue is whether the things we are doing day by day are done in a conscious and balanced way or are part of a pain-ridden struggle. If yours be the latter method, stop. Raymond Arthur Dart, 1893-1988, was the most extraordinary man. His academic excellence, quest for knowledge and incredible tenacity under fire are traits that defined him throughout his life. From outstanding scholar, anatomist, war surgeon, medical professor and anthropologist, Raymond Dart defined himself by his accomplishments rather than any job title. As a man of Ipswich grammar throughout his life, he modelled the values enshrined by our school today. His influence was far greater than IGS or even the Ipswich area, reaching out around the world over generations to change the way the scientific world considered the origins of man, and ultimately how so many of us today think about who and what we are. His lasting contribution to evolution continues to define science. In floods, the fifth of nine children, Raymond Arthur Dart seemed an unlikely candidate to change the world's thinking on the origins of man. Raised on a dairy farm, Raymond demonstrated an early aptitude for acquiring knowledge. Dart attended IGS from 1906 to 1910. While the school history on Dart is limited, his intellectual prowess and capacity for critical thinking were clearly shaped at IGS, as he exemplified excellence, leadership, community and integrity, core values of the school. What he appears to have lacked in sporting ability, he more than compensated for as a gifted scholar, achieving academic excellence on his junior examinations, a feat he seemed destined to repeat throughout his career. Upon graduating from IGS in 1910, Dart won a scholarship to the University of Queensland, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science with honours in Biology and a Master of Science. He won further scholarships and prizes to Sydney University, where he attended St Andrews College and completed a medical degree. In 1917, while still a student, Raymond Dart became a university demonstrator in anatomy. Shortly after completing his studies in July 1918, Dart, now a fully registered doctor, signed up with the Australian Army Medical Corps as a captain. While World War I continued to rage on the Western Front, Dart served as a medical officer in military hospitals in England and France. I wonder if he ever treated an IGS old boy. Did they share a joke about a school on a hill half a world away? After Raymond Dart was discharged from the Army, he chose to stay in England rather than return to Australia before briefly working in the United States as a result of yet another scholarship. In 1923, at the urging of Elliot Smith, another Australian and distinguished anatomist, who had become something of a mentor to him, Dart moved to South Africa. With a burgeoning reputation as an anatomist, Raymond Dart was considered one of the leading doctors and educators of his time. Sent as a junior professor to the University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg in South Africa, Dart helped establish the medical school at the university, becoming dean and eventual head of the medical school for 18 years. However, his greatest contribution to science was not as a man of medicine, but instead evolution. In 1924, while supposedly dressing to act as best man for a wedding, but actually rummaging through a box of fossils collected by some of his students at his encouragement, Dart made the discovery that was to expose him first to 20 years of derision and ridicule in scientific circles before vindication and reverence. Dart, with his exceptional background in anatomy, recognised that one of the fossils was the skull of an early hominid, an extinct link between man and his simian ancestor. Over the next three months, Dart tenaciously chiselled away at what would come to be known as the Tong Child skull, or the Australopithecus africanus, gently removing rock with sharpened knitting needles borrowed from his wife. Dart had found the missing link that supported Darwin's theory of evolution, that human life evolved from the plains of Africa. It must be understood that Dart had no training in anthropology. Dart's theory contradicted the theory and findings of leading English anthropologist Sir Arthur Keith, who claimed the first humanoids derived from Europe. Keith and his supporters went to great lengths to vilify and ridicule Dart's evidence, shaming him globally, with claims his findings were preposterous. Dart continued to make further discoveries supporting his case, with an increasing number of anthropologists making similar discoveries in Africa. However, it took nearly 25 years before Dart's discovery was finally accepted by the global scientific community after Sir Arthur Keith's fraud was exposed. Not only did he live to see the wrong against him corrected, but also enjoy a very long and prosperous scientific career.
the man whose work he ridiculed for 20 years. I was one of those who took the point of view that when the adult form of town was discovered, it would prove to be near akin to the living African anthropoids, the gorilla and the chimpanzee. I am now convinced that Professor Dart was right and I was wrong. By 1946, Dart and Broom were no longer outcasts. As more and more evidence of primitive man was found in the weathered gorges of South Africa, Robert Broom and Raymond Dart were finally hailed as great discoverers. By 1950, the evolutionary pathway of the human race had become clear. The African skulls with their small brains were the oldest missing links found. Tong, Krumdrai. Far younger are the bigger brained fossils of Peking man, the Neanderthals, and finally, modern man. But one mystery remained. England's Piltdown Man, the big brain skull with its ape-like jaw, was totally unlike any other fossil. By 1950, so many more ape-man fossils of Australopithecus had been found in Africa that Piltdown had become a veritable enigma. And looking at the question, one of Dart's former students, Joe Viner, came to the conclusion that the only way that it could be explained was if it had been fraudulently salted into the gravel at Piltdown. We were travelling back to Oxford one evening after a conference at which we'd been discussing the Piltdown problem. I was wondering how one could possibly explain the curious contradictions of these finds. Well, then it occurred to me that one possibility might well be that someone had deliberately placed the parts of the cranium with a broken jaw of a modern ape. Viner was right. Laboratory tests showed Piltdown Man to be an elaborate hoax. A human skull that was only 500 years old with the jaw of a modern orangutan. The jaw rapidly yielded critical evidence. The molar teeth had been filed down to give a human-like wear pattern rather than an ape-like wear pattern. The joint of the jaw, which joints it to the base of the skull, that had been deliberately broken away so that the telltale giveaway evidence was removed. The other giveaway evidence of an ape jaw is in the chin region and that had been smashed away. The newspapers soon announced the death of a creature that had never lived. A crime against scientific advancement that endured for more than 40 years. But who was its perpetrator? The shocking news of the forgery caused a media frenzy. First of all, have another look at the picture of Dawson. Here it is. Is it the face of a fanatic who would mislead his colleagues so cunningly for so long? Or is it the face of an enthusiastic amateur who was hoaxed and misled by some ill-wisher? Perhaps we shall know for certain one day, but perhaps we shall never know. What we do know even now... And the Piltdown fraud continued to fascinate scientists. In conclusion, after looking into Raymond Dart's past, I feel like I've come to know the man a little. He contributed to the scientific community, excelling in all his fields of endeavour, and subsequently was a leader in the fields of medicine and anthropology. Raymond Dart, I believe, was a man of integrity, a man forged in the halls of Ipswich Grammar School.